Following their success in the arcade, Nintendo embarked on an ambitious new project, a home console with arcade-style graphics. Their efforts produced the 8-bit Family Computer, or Famicom. Despite developer Masayuki Uemura's predictions of failure, the Famicom would sell 2.5 million units by the end of 1984. Launch titles included Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., and Popeye. Apart from re-releases, Mario's newest roles began in the form of cameos. Pinball is, well, pinball. If you can get your ball into the hole, you get a breakout style bonus room with Mario and Pauline. This would mark Pauline's last appearance until 1994. There was also golf. The weird thing about this game is that in the West, in spite of his appearance, you're playing as Mario. But in Japan, this was retcon through a Wii game exclusive to that country called Captain Rainbow. Over there, you're playing as a guy called Osan, or middle-aged guy, which incidentally was an early code name for the Mario character himself. Golf also had a Game Boy port, but we'll hold off on that platform until later. Cameos aside, the Mario Brothers would get starring roles in Wrecking Crew. Bet you didn't know that Mario and Luigi moonlit as demolition workers now, did you? You use your hammer to bust everything in the stage, all while avoiding eggplant men and gotcha wrenches. Also in your way is an irritable foreman called Spike. Hey, wrong Spike and you know it. There we go. He wants to see you dead. Occasionally you go to a bonus round where you have to bust down walls to find a coin before Spike does. But the game can cheat sometimes. Being three bombs in a specific order gives you hidden bonuses, depending on the stage number and the amount of swings used. And if you're really lucky, you can find the gold hammer, which breaks walls with one blow. I wonder how many Smash Bros. players remember this thing. You can also earn 1-ups by collecting letters that spell your character's name. Wrecking Crew even came with a level editor, allowing players to create and play their own levels. The Japanese gaming industry was booming. In the United States, though, things weren't exactly rosy. Poorly produced games were everywhere. E.T and the Atari 2600 port of Pac-Man were the biggest offenders, and non-existent quality control allowed for any kind of game to get out on the market. Games about dental care, games about Kool-Aid, games about dog food, even games that were straight up porn. While arcades were still popular during this time, the fever was starting to die down, and even the games there suffered from mediocrity. All of this was compounded by the advent of home computers, like the Commodore 64. Computers were seen by the average consumer to be a better investment than a game console, where they could do more than just play video games. After enjoying over a year of success in Japan, Nintendo made the risky move of bringing the Famicom to North America in 1985.
and attempted partnership with Atari fell through, leaving the Japanese company to sell the console, now redesigned and dubbed the Nintendo Entertainment System themselves. Its initial market, New York City. Retailers believe that the deluxe sets were wise operating buddy to be the console's big selling point. But history would take a different course. 